Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome in Jesus' name. We greet you, those of you online. Welcome. I hope you've come with an appetite today because we are studying an odd God part two. And I'm just going to stay as long as I need to stay. We're looking at the life of John the Baptist, and we're looking at the season that we're walking into, which has so many parallels to the life of the Baptist. Let me read my text again. Matthew 3, 1 through 5, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region round about Jordan. May God bless the reading of his word. Isaiah 28, 21, the Lord will rise up to do his strange work and perform his task, his alien task. And we corrected 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, moved away from the King James Bible, which says, avoid all appearance of evil. And we gave you the literal Greek, avoid all kinds of evil, because we are living in a time now where if someone is going to define evil, an appearance of evil, that leaves a definition open for every silly person in the world to look at your life and consider an appearance of evil. We are moving into a season where everything is going to appear odd. And we looked at, we picked up, we began six strands of looking at John the Baptist. We looked at his message, which was a message of abject offense. In the Jewish community, there were ritual ablutions and washings that all Orthodox Jews were engaged in, but John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for all the Jewish leaders. This was unheard of. Gentiles would be converted and baptized, but Orthodox Jewish leaders were never called to baptism, but John called them to a degree of great offense. And let me just remind you of what we went through last week. The first point last week was don't judge anyone after the flesh. John came from an odd pedigree. Remember his parents. They were faithful, but they had not been fruitful, and so they were misread. John's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, were considered to be cursed by God because although they were faithful in their priestly service, they didn't have fruit. And back then, if you didn't have a certain degree of fruit, you were considered cursed of God. And we we looked at the fact that we do not want to misread in the next little while people, places, things. We're going to need a discriminating wisdom moving forward in this next season which is, was utterly required for John the Baptist because he was a very odd character. Now remember, he comes from a parentage involved in the priesthood, yet he was going to be a prophet. So everything about John's life was odd. It was very strange. It was very unseemly. And if you looked in the natural, he might have looked like a failure. This is a guy that lived almost his entire life in the wilderness, utter isolation, He is eating a weird diet that we looked at, locusts and wild honey. He is dressed, we're going to focus on his dress today, with camel's hair garments. Everything about the guy looked suspicious, yet the Lord Jesus said he was the most successful person. He said, born among women, there's no greater man than this man. And that he perfectly fulfilled the will of God for his generation, although doing so made him look odd. Have you, has anyone ever looked at you and, and defined your situation as the appearance of evil? That's why we have to translate 1 Thessalonians 5.22 correctly. Jesus sleeping on the floor in Bethany with Mary and Martha and Lazarus could have been the appearance of evil. The apostle Paul spending most of his ministry life in prison, being beaten after every sermon, could have looked like the appearance of evil. Have people ever framed your story in in a way that you, they have the gift of suspicion kick in when it comes to you? You can tell before they pray at a prayer meeting, I just wanted to share a little more about Gretchen before we pray for her and and frame the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Loved one, you can, we found out last week as we looked at our second strand we, we, we don't want to judge after the flesh, but notice the, the diet of John Locust. So we found out that the man is eating stuff that was nasty looking. That, his diet looks suspicious. 
Yet we found out locusts in Leviticus 11.22 were clean. God's about to do some things that look really weird. They look as weird as John eating a diet of locusts. Ooh. But locusts looked odd, but they were clean. And sometimes God is at work doing things in our lives that look really weird, but they're clean. Be quick to judge. Don't be too quick to judge what's of God and what isn't. We're going to look at Samson in just a minute and find out his parents misjudged his whole story. Now, you've heard sermons on Samson, right? The lusty guy, and he's wicked, and he lost his vision, and his eyes were put out, and this and that. Oh, no, you have to see the overarching sovereign story. Samson was a complete success in his 20-year judgeship because God wanted his lust to bring him behind enemy lines into the Philistine world so God could utterly destroy the Philistine rule. Loved one, he's bigger than you think. And that's why it's really important not to judge right now. Remember Jesus in Matthew 7 said, judge not lest ye be judged, right? People say, well, the Bible says don't judge. Well, the Bible says we're to evaluate everything. We're to eat the hay and spit out the, you know, the eat the hay and spit out the sticks. We're to eat the fish and spit out the bones. John chapter 6 says we are to judge righteous judgment in all things. What we can't do is put a label, an ultimate label of judgment. She was an idiot. She's an idiot now. She'll always be an idiot. Only God can say that of her because he alone is in the helicopter with the perspective to see if she can be labeled an idiot in the past, the present, and the future. Now, we aren't in that place, so we're forbidden to make ultimate judgments, but we are commanded to judge all things at all times. If you don't, are you eating breakfast cereal or rat poison? It's very important to evaluate everything. The people, the places, the things surrounding your life. That's not forbidden. What's forbidden is the ultimate label you stick on somebody. And, and the reason why God says don't do that in Matthew 7 is because you can find yourself misjudging the work of God in a person's life, in their history, in their story. Read the whole book of Job. It's not about what it's about. And his friends were really great. When he lost everything, they came for seven days, wore sackcloth and ashes, and kept their mouths shut, and everything was fine. Then they started talking. <sighs> the Bible warns of the fool whose belly is full, who pushes himself away from the table and begins to talk. And that's what they begin to do. In all the chapters of Job, God lets them gas. He lets them misjudge. And then he comes down and threatens them all and says, you've all spoken evil about my servant Job. You all missed it. Whoops. See, you don't have to repent of stuff you never say. So in this season moving forward, don't judge after the flesh. Don't mistake locust realities that look weird, but they are clean and they're of the Lord. And we looked at locusts last week. They're always misjudged. So John's in the wilderness eating locusts. Remember, locusts were the little creatures that brought wilderness. Wherever locusts are, they, you never see a lone locust. They always travel in hordes, billions of them. And when they fix their gaze on a crop, it is a foregone conclusion. They will eat you out of house and home. They are flexible. If they focus on a crop, they will get in, and they will get into your house. If they have to shrink down and go through it under a door, if they have to go through the window, locusts are unstoppable because they're wise enough to move together in hordes. And alone, they're utterly helpless. But when they hoard together, there's no stopping them. So here John is eating one at a time for 30 years locusts, a prophetic act of saying, I eat the things that represent a wilderness creation to you. And the one coming after me, the Messiah, he is the one. He is the Lord who destroys all the locust swarms. There was John Everything he does has a significance. Now, we don't want to overread into things, but I am going through the strands I'm going through, and I'm going to take my time because John represents. Now, now think of this. 30 years in the wilderness for one year of ministry. I mean, all those decades in seminary for 12 months tops. And six of those months were overlapping the ministry of Jesus, so that dug into his ratings on Christian television. So... 
six months by himself, he was at the apex of his weirdness and strangeness, and that's all God wanted him to do was to be a voice in the wilderness who was living where he was because the people were destitute, and hence he ministered in the wilderness. But secondly, even what he ate, locusts. Locusts are always misjudged. They're misjudged for their strength. They don't fly, they leap. So people think they're flying everywhere. They don't, they leap. And many of you have been misjudged in terms of your strength. Some people don't realize that the hell you went through and what you've survived is where your strength comes from. The brokenness you've endured is where your strength comes from. And locusts are always misjudged and they're misevaluated because people misjudge the source of their strength. And just as they looked at John and he was weird looking, and just as though, well, I would just pray that you would withhold judgment the next six months, that you would just pray for everyone, bless everyone, and pass no sticky label judgments on a person, a place, or a thing, because you're going to be wrong in most of your instances, because we're in this John the Baptist season. Where you think it's weird, just wait. It's going to get weirder. In the original Greek, it means weirder. In the Hebrew, in Ugaritic, it means weirder. I'm glad I clarified that. John the Baptist was obscure, isolated, looked like he was unsuccessful, but he wasn't. He wasn't. Because you know what? His fruitfulness was not in terms of what anyone had ever expected. And that's why you can't even evaluate yourself. The Apostle Paul said, I don't even judge myself. He goes, I got these young people in ministry passing judgment on me. I don't even know how I'm doing with the Lord. I don't even know if I'm fulfilling my destiny. How can they evaluate me when I don't even know what's going on to evaluate myself? And he's being beaten and knocked down and dragged out on a rail and thrown into prison, writing all of his epistles from prison. We could barely see with the, the degree of light that he's got in there with all that tar coming up in his eyes. Rats all over the place. These weren't holiday in rooms. And he spends the majority of his ministry in behind bars to where the young ministers are preaching the gospel, mocking him, saying, well, at least we're blessed of God and out here not bound up. And Paul said, Lord, I rejoice that the gospel is preached. <laughs> Wasn't that a lovely, positive attitude? They're devils. They don't have any scars. But I rejoice that the gospel is finding mouthpieces. Yeah, amen. <clears throat> Let them go. The Lord hath need of them. That's Paul's opinion. He's being misjudged every step he takes. Paul wouldn't be invited to conferences in this time. If he was still alive, we wouldn't let him on the platform. Looks too strange. Could I, could I, could I preach at your church? No, no, no. So sorry. How about not? Okay. But you can sit in the last chair in the very back. All right. Put him up in the nosebleed section. Loved one, don't think that you are any less capable of misjudging the universe than these people were 2,000 years ago. John is the mouthpiece who is announcing the Messiah's arrival, and everybody can't get past, he's in the wilderness, he's single, he's eating locusts, that's going to get him on eHarmony. And he's eating wild honey. Remember last week we pointed out that honey, again, it was suspicious. Locusts look weird, but they're clean. And honey was considered clean, but bees were considered unclean. So, so there's this technical need for utter discrimination because everything John is doing looks suspicious. Now let me get to the next strand, which is one of my favorite. The camels. He wore clothes made of camel's hair. And the point is we must discern between what is truly clean and unclean moving forward. Now, moving on with our gift of suspicion, retuned and refocused, now we're looking at the fact that camels are unclean animals. You couldn't eat them. 
If they died, you couldn't touch their body. But look at the refined sense. John has collated camel hair, which was allowed. You, can't, you don't want to touch them because they might be dead and you don't know it and then you're defiled. You certainly don't want to eat one. But why don't we just stay away from camels altogether, John? I'll tell you what, John. Let's, it's a no-camel zone. Okay? We want you to look really presentable. Okay? So we're going to dump the locust thing. And the honeys, that's really, you know, walking the line here. Okay? Honeybees are unclean, but honey isn't. But it just looks suspicious, and we don't want to make people think too deeply. So let's make it a no honey zone, okay? And definitely the camel thing. Let's just have a talk. Someone's going to misread clean versus unclean. They're going to think you're unclean from a distance. And some people looking on at your life from a distance see you, and your life looks as weird as what I'm talking about. What you're wearing, where you're living, what you're eating, everything about you, they're just sure. Father, we just lift up this person to you. I was in a prayer meeting where they had such disgust for the person they were praying for. We lift this thing before you, Lord. We ask you to touch it and do something. Lift one. <laughs> That's how we pray, at least in our minds. Father, we pray that you would break her teeth if necessary, that you would wake her up from her slumber, Lord, and maybe all our demons would be drawn away. You have not lived until you've been in a coven, a prayer coven, I mean a prayer meeting, and you've heard an entire menu that evening of everybody mispraying and misinterpreting everything God is doing in everyone's life that they had on the list. <laughs> That's called witchcraft. That isn't prayer. Yes, point number one, we're going to pray for Susie. Lord, bless this loose woman. And Lord, we pray in your mercy, if you will, and if you shed your blood for her, and she's one of the elect, if at all, that you would, don't you love people that tell stories during prayer? They don't pray. Father, is Rimtham sad to wrap that in the midst of the, you know, don't teach me the Bible when you're praying. And don't pray witchcraft when you're praying. Father, we lift Mark Boykin before you and because God knows someone has to lift him somewhere. <laughs> and, we be and then you have four or five people. You know, they, they tag team. And then they're all, by the time poor Mark wonders why he, his lumbago hurts, because we've got people sticking pins <laughs> in his image. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff we need to avoid moving forward the next little while because everyone was misjudging John. Now we're going to get to the camel issue. Now, why would camels mean anything? Why would we talk about a thread of camels? I don't know if you remember it, but in Genesis chapter 24, there is a delicious story, verses 63 to 65. Isaac went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master. The servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Loved one, the camels are coming. It's an age-old sermon about the fact that God, in Genesis 24, needed to find a bride for Isaac. Abraham sends his servant to find a bride. He said, don't go to the Canaanites. I want you to go to my own home, my own relatives, and I want you to find. So Eliezer, the type of the Holy Spirit, is sent out by the Father to find a bride for his son. Don't know if there are any themes there we could dig into. Eliezer goes, and, and, and there are ten camels that he has. And they go, and they find, and he prays a prayer before they go into the city. He goes, please, Lord, let the young woman who waters my camels be the woman who is to marry Isaac. And miracle of miracles, the text tells us some interesting thing. talks about some hard work. Bear with me for a minute. To lift ten kilograms of water, that's 20 or 30 feet up, a well is exhausting. A thirsty camel can drink 30% of its body weight in three minutes. That's 200 liters of water or 44 gallons. That's 20 buckets of water. Notice there were 10 camels. Eliezer stops 
and he says, I want to sign, here's my fleece. If, 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 if the, this woman that comes out is of God, I want her to be a miracle supergirl. I want her to agree to give us water and then feed water to all the camels. Now, let me break some of this down to you. These wells are 20 to 30 feet in depth. She's a young girl, Jenny in her teens. She's got to take her container and run up and down. And the text says, listen to this, 20 buckets of water for each camel. Oh, there's 10 camels. 10 camels. 20 buckets of water each. That would be 200 buckets of water out of the well. 200 buckets is two tons of water. Now, if they raised one of the buckets per minute, it would take three hours and 20 minutes to water the camels. If it was two every two minutes, it would take seven hours. The lifting combined was like lifting three of the camels 20 feet up and down. Can you see this little girl is running up and down with this weight? She's healthy. She's vibrant, and she's a little miracle girl. And she's set by God to water all of those camels. We have no idea how long it took, but it sure was an exhausting proposition how much food she would have to eat to have strength in order to lift three of those camels worth of water. Loved one, some of you don't realize that you're going up and down and you're bearing the weights that you born throughout your entire life. That exercise has strengthened you to be able to bear what the camels are bearing. Rebecca didn't know that hidden under the blankets on those camels were all the riches, all the reward, all the symbols of her bridal party, the gold, the silver, all of the rewards that she God worked her out her whole life to give her a muscular structure to be able to carry weight. She's been carrying the weight of water, but it's about to switch just like that. The camels are coming. They're bringing all of the provision, exceeding abundantly above and beyond all you could ask or think. This little girl's running up and down 20 feet. She's, she's taking hours to water these camels, but she doesn't know. That as soon as that's done, that is the miracle Elias is looking for. And it says that he took some gold bracelets and he said, come here, honey. What's your name? What's your name? Who's your family? And he begins to put a gold nose ring in and he begins to put all the bracelets on. Loved one, loved one, the camels are coming. Hold on. All of your life has prepared you for this moment. All the ups and downs, notice, are all of a sudden going to lead to a straight path of her getting on the camel. I'll give you the thunder up front. Eliezer goes to her house and says, this is the woman I want to marry my Lord's son. And they said to her, are you willing to go? She said, I will go. And now, the rest of her life, she's not going up and down anymore. She's going in a straight line. And they got on those camels. And a loved one, that was about a thousand-mile journey. God, by bringing John even close to the image of camel hair, brought to mind all the biblical references to camels. They represented unclean things used by God to bury colossal weights, bear colossal weights to bring nourishment to the people of God. Just as John and Jesus were announcing the very kingdom of God coming, so just the camel's hair suggested with Remez the story, the most famous story of camels in the Bible, Genesis 24. The weight that God had to work you out to bear is going to now shift from water to gold, water to silver, water to jewels. And you didn't even know while you were working out what God was preparing you for. Oh, there's a weight coming. And it'll be a weight that we hope you won't complain about. Oh, there's gold. This gold is so heavy. What's in your bucket? Diamonds. Oh, diamonds are so heavy. No, 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 no. You can shift my weight, Jesus. 
You can take water out of my vessel now and put gold in, put diamonds in. Put it. It's not about prosperity. It's, about, it's not about the coins. It's about the idea that John is announcing the greatest move of God in the history of the world. The Messiah himself, God in human flesh, is just about to show up on the scene, which is going to eclipse gold and silver and stuff. The Lord, the honey maker himself, is here. The Lord of the locusts, who can destroy anything that would destroy you, is here. And John said, the camels are here for you. Exceeding abundantly above and beyond all you could ask or think. You say, Greg, you got an awful lot out of camel hair. Amen. I can find it. The camels are coming. Provision is coming. Turnaround is coming. But notice it's going to be flat land blessing. No more up and down. You know, God is gracious. We go up and down, up and down. You know, he brings us up. But do you know God can bring us up and keep us up? That's what we need. All the walking up and down and up and down is much better when you're on the back of a camel decked in gold and silver and on your way to your wedding. I don't think she minded the, the little hump bump on the camels because she's dreaming the whole way. Oh, my husband. And it says that he's meditating out in the field and he saw the camels coming. Oh, she saw the camels coming and didn't know while she was bearing the weight of all that water that those camels bore the weight of her blessing and her future. And Isaac strained his eyes and said, who is that? The camels were coming on his end. Everybody's getting their comeuppance for good and for evil right now. Those that have waited all their lives and have just been obedient to go up and down and do the workout program at the gym God's assigned you to without complaint, because he'll keep you there until you quit complaining, by the way, just in case you don't know. Oh, yeah. Remember, 40 years in the wilderness was for what? Homosexuality, no. Complaint, murmuring. There weren't transgender questions. It was ingratitude. Not being thankful. God said, I will wipe that generation out. As I live, they will never enter the land. Now calm down. Moses always has to say, now calm down. The Egyptians are going to get the wrong idea. You go killing all your people, they're going to think you're, you know, calm down. <laughs> oh, love when he's not going to calm down. What a beautiful set of strands, all looking at the Baptist. All there. It's all there. The camels are coming. Everything they represent. Now, see, if you misread the camel's hair, it could look suspicious. But if the camels here remind you of camels and remind you of the Bible and what the Bible says about camel, then you start going, oh, we are preparing for some goodies. There's some goodies coming. John isn't a weirdo. He's a proclaimer of goodies. He's saying the gifts aren't here. The gift giver himself incarnate is here. The blessings aren't here. The blesser is here. He's here. I must decrease. He must increase. And John's disciples started misunderstanding all of it. And they come to him and go, you know, Jesus' disciples are baptizing more people than you or us. Right over there. John goes, it's okay. He must increase. I must decrease. Oh, what good news. John represented the personification of good news. He's pointing to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's pointing to God incarnate in human flesh, the desire of all the ages who has come. And John's just pointing. He goes, don't, look, don't misread my outfit. Don't misread my diet. Don't misread why I'm in the wilderness. Because the Lord who moves all mountains and destroys them and raises up all valleys, he is coming to make a straight path in the wilderness. He is coming to take you from your ups and downs and put you on some solid ground. You may be on a camel, but you're at least going to be on solid ground, advancing towards your destiny. 
and your wedding. Oh, it's getting good. Everything's changing, correct? Everything is changing. But if you don't understand that you're Rebecca having trained all the years going up and down 20 feet at a time with all that water, and if you don't get better but you get bitter, you will stay there in that gym. Did you ever start the gym thing with great passion and realize you've been paying $30 a month for 14 years that you didn't take that off? <laughs> you opened up your account. They're taking $30 a month and go, did I ever go to that gym? No. Is that membership still? Yeah, yeah. You paid $7 trillion for the three gym memberships you're unaware are still being, where's all my money going? God knows when our hearts are ready to be usable to him. And it's a time where we need to get better and not be bitter and not allow any more misjudgments against ourselves when we look in the mirror or let alone anyone else that we're looking at. You know, I don't know about you, but it takes me all my time and effort to keep me straight and in line. I don't have a lot of time to be wasting it on other people and my evaluations of who I think they are. It's just not worth expending that kind of energy when it's a John the Baptist season, when you're going to be wrong about everything. You know? Well, the honey is, no, you're wrong about that. Well, the locust, you know, you're wrong about that. Well, he's in the wilderness, and he's in, you're wrong about that. He's a failure, and he's single, you're wrong about that. He's a resounding success. And love one, by the way, success is bearing fruit faithfully where God has planted you. That is success. Well, I don't have gold. and he, John didn't have gold, but John had a faithful life. And Jesus said, he was 100% fulfilled in all of his destiny for his generation. Greatest man ever born of a woman, that guy. But the least in the kingdom is greater than he. It's a whole new transition season. So that's why we need to keep our judgments in line and keep your arrows in your quiver and resist the temptation to shoot everything and everyone right now. Let us move on. It has become convicting in this place. Next strand. The next strand. So the training of your lifetime, beloved, is going to prepare you to bear the ornaments of the goodness of the Lord. I think I'll just do one more. Winnowing occurs on the threshing floor. In John the Baptist, we see winnowing and threshing. Luke three seventeen. The text says, of the Messiah, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Isaiah 21.10, my people who are crushed on the threshing floor, I tell you what I have heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. John's ministry pointed a finger at the reality of threshing and winnowing. You say, Craig, what's that? Oh, hold on. You're going to love this. <laughs> okay, we've heard the wine press teaching. We've heard the oil. Everybody wants the oil. Nobody wants the crushing teaching. Could we move on to a different teaching? No, we can't. <laughs> Because John points out that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be recognizable because he's going to bring his winnowing fork in his hand. And he is going to winnow the cereal products. The grain he is going to burn up with unquenchable fire and the wheat he's going to put securely after it's separated in its garner. Oh, what's this? Well, let me introduce you to winnowing. Let me read you an interesting text. Judges 6.11, it says of Gideon, Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Listen to this. He's threshing wheat, cereal products. Where? In the wine press. Now, what do you usually do in a wine press? You crush grapes. He's hidden in the dark, at the bottom of a wine press, threshing wheat. Now let's talk about what does what this have to do with anything? And what's this unquenchable fire? No, this is good fire. It doesn't say Jesus is burning everybody with unquenchable fire. It says he is consuming the chaff. 
See, when cereal products are still in the earth, the grain and the stock are friends. They have a marriage. But as soon as you harvest cereal products, you have a divorce that is absolutely mandated. Because the wheat and the stock married while planted in the ground, once they're harvested, become mortal enemies and they can never be allowed to be together again. And therefore, the threshing floor is this flat ground on a high place. And after they harvest the cereal products, the wheat, they come and they bring it all and they throw it on the threshing floor and they begin to beat everything. <laughs> And then they take a winnowing fork and they throw it in the air and the west wind takes the chaff, the former covering that used to be the protection of the wheat and blows the chaff away. And in fact, chaff cannot be digested. It can only be digested by animals. Humans can't digest it. So you don't want to make food out of it. But I'm... I feel the Lord has called me to a ministry of chaff pies. Yes, I saw, it wasn't a voice as much as it was a vision. As it wasn't a vision, it was just a tickly, tickly feeling here. And, and it was that I am to wear a chaff hat with chaff gloves, chaff pants, a chaff shirt, and I'm to make chaff cake and pies for all. Well, darling, chaff can, is undigestible. Chaff is only able to be plowed under or burnt with fire. Look at my new chaff wardrobe. Mm -hmm. We're living in a time, loved one, where this thread of winnowing has to be seen for what it is because God's fire is coming to burn up all chaff relationships, chaff friendships, chaff wardrobes, and chaff pies. I made you a chaff pie. Come on in. It's destined for destruction. You don't want... <laughs> Fire produces great fear in chaff. Let's just say it was conscious. Let's say your chaff was sentient chaff. The fire's coming. You say, oh, chaff hats, chaff clothes, beware. And there's a spirit of fear in the chaff community. Guess what? There needs to be because there's a fire coming and it is going to consume all of the chaff. And what is the chaff? It was once the protective covering that was legitimate in the season of when you were growing in the ground. But now what you were married to you must be divorced from. Did you know God is bringing a bill of divorcement all through the body of Christ right now? He's divorcing people, places, and things from our lives. You say, Craig, divorce is a bad word. Divorce doesn't just mean spouse is breaking up. It means God removing anything you're unequally yoked in relation to pulling it apart. And it's something that used to bless you. I remember Dr. Henry Cloud always tells the story of the person who you know, lives in Alaska that they put on all blankets and they put on everything you can and they put on bedding and the, anything to survive. But you get in a plane and fly to Miami, Florida, and you get out and walk around 100-degree weather for an hour and you start peeling stuff off because what used to keep you alive that you needed to be married to, you now need to be divorced, divorced, divorced from. And that's the imagery of wheat and chaff. Wheat represents the important stuff that's valuable. Chaff represents the light thing that is absolutely unimportant. And did you know God in this discriminating time is calling us to have wisdom to discern between wheat and chaff? You say, Craig, well, that sounds stupid. That's obvious. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, no, it isn't. We die on the wrong battlefields all the time. All my Christian friends die on the wrong battlefields 24 hours a day, drowning in shallow water all the time. No, they don't. Yes, they do. Do you remember Isaiah said, Woe unto those that call dark light and light dark and sweet sour and sour sweet and true false and false true and up, up and down, down. The confused, you say, well, Craig, I'm not like that. People that are not wise misread chaff and wheat all the time. And they make chaff wardrobes. How's it going? They go on chaff cruises. Mm -hmm. She's the best-looking stock of chaff I've ever seen in my life. What's your name, honey? Chaffy. Oh, all right. Just don't get near fire. <laughs> it's gone. 
I mean, it's consumed in a moment. And John says, good news. With the advent of the Messiah, he's going to help you with your wisdom in terms of knowing what wheat and chaff are. Did you know there are greater matters of the law and lesser matters of the law? Do you know in the Bible that when you put a person, place, or thing in the place only God can hold, that's called idolatry. When you put a creature in the ultimate place, that's called idolatry. And when you put chaff up as wheat, that's idolatry. And the fire will deal with it just like that. I know he's wheat. He's very heavy. Bring the fire. If it survives the fire. (laughs) Sounds like something I'd say to my kids. Okay. Everybody's right. Everybody's wrong. If this survives the fire, (laughs) you can keep it. Oh, goody, goody. Daddy said we can keep it. If it survives the fire. And you're talking to someone wearing a chaff outfit with a big chaff hat. They are... Susan Chaffee, Gary Chaffee. Did you know that fire alone reveals you can't digest chaff? And the Lord says, you know, part of this new move is that I'm going to distinguish with my fire what's really a weightier matter, the wheat. Now notice, the separation is absolutely necessary. No God is the one who prunes, right? You know that the Lord is the one who discriminates between wheat and chaff. Well, he puts it this way. I must separate the chaff from the wheat so that I can put the wheat in a secure, safe garner. Did you know the separation that you're enduring right now is going to yield in you being in a safe, secure garner? (sighs) Bring the separation. And you know where they do the winnowing? They go to the high place at night and the west wind would blow and ideally the wind is enough you know you take the stuff and you throw it down on the solid and by the way do you know how they made threshing floors they pounded them into flatness god is lowering the mountains and raising the valleys loved one and just like rebecca was going to be on solid ground no more ups and downs with her camel so the threshing floor is pounded into flatness because on the threshing floor is where this lovely process called winnowing occurs now ideally if if the chaff and the wheat are separated you just need a little of the west wind to separate the two If you insist on holding on to your chaff, that's not a chaff friend, that's a wheat friend. Okay, the fire will reveal that. Hopefully, the wind does it. But if the wind doesn't work, they bring the flail in and they beat that whole mess again. (laughs) I'm never going to let go of this husk. In the name of God, he can strike me down here. But I, don't worry. He's got the wind and he's got the flail. And third, if you're not dislodged from your husks, he brings the oxen in that chew the cud and walk in circles and weight down the entire threshing floor. <laughs> the husks will be removed. The wheat and the chaff will realize their true divorce. A bill of divorcement in the Jewish community is called a get where you give this G-E-T, you give this and you say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and it's done. God is giving us bills of divorcement for chaff friendships, chaff relationships, chaff situations, chaff ministries. Maybe you have even had a prophetic chaff mantle that the fire (laughs) is, is burning down right now. Good news, the Lord is going to divorce you from what would harm you and destroy you. Loved one, how many things did you, when you were younger, can you think back? Do you have any woulda, coulda, shouldas like I have? If only, if only I knew what I'm talking about now, 45 years ago, uh, my life would have been on a different track in a lot of ways. Because I didn't know the, dis- the distinguishing between chaff and wheat. So I was building lives out of chaff. <laughs> I was inviting chaff friends. We're going to build a chaff Bible study. Okay? Yeah. Can I go? You can go too. Let's all go and burn up together. You know, it was just, it was a ghastly. I look back over my life now and I go, ah! See, I didn't know the discrimination between locusts, that they looked weird, but they were clean. I didn't realize that honey was clean, but honeybees weren't. I didn't realize 
that all the weight going up and down would qualify me to bear greatness. I didn't real. I was too confused by my own choices to see wheat from chaff. Guess what, though? I can give you a spoonful of this message today, and you never have to go through those issues. Isn't that lovely? You, you don't have to accumulate chaff doctrine. Oh, God, that'll kill you right there. If the devil can't get you immortal, he'll give you false teaching because he knows if he feeds you chaff doctrine, you're gone much more deeply and much more profoundly. And by the way, every heretic I've ever met is the nicest folk in the world. I've never met a mean heretic. They're sweet, they're nice, they're gracious, and they deny the Trinity and they deny the deity of Christ and they deny the authority of the Bible. Nicest folk you've ever met sometimes. But chaff is chaff is chaff is chaff. And we have to, in this time, reserve our judgment in evaluating others in an ultimate sense. But in our own lives, if Jesus says, Craig, you were married to that stock that used to protect you, but now it's chaff. The harvest has happened. You need to give them up, her up, him up, that up. I need to be willing to say, wind, come take the husk away. I don't need the oxen. (laughs) Now, I know you don't need the oxen brought in. Do you see how valuable these threads are? All this out of a guy, a single guy, dressed weird, eating weird in a place, but oh my Lord. Three decades of his life for one year of ministry. You know, I often tell my friends, one year under the anointing of the Holy Ghost in an age now where we are all connected globally, God will do things that are beyond anything we could ever imagine. One year under the anointing. John probably baptized 500,000 people in 12 months, six of which he shared with Jesus that he's correcting his disciples about. He's good. I announced him. I must decrease. He must, you know, you may be solid, but your followers can be weird. <laughs> and 20 years later in Acts 19, Paul shows up and there are followers of John the Baptist that never heard any different. They're still following John like a little cult. Didn't hear about Jesus. Didn't hear a thing John said. If you ever heard John preach, the one thing you knew is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 20 years later, he's still got a cult following him that didn't get his message. (laughs) Isn't God merciful to all of us? It's an odd God, loved one. But you know what? His ways are eminently rational when you walk with him and you get to know him and you learn his word and the Holy Spirit brings it to life. You start going, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. We have to discern between honey and bees. We have to discern between locusts. We have to discern between camel's hair and camels being unclean. You know, I heard somebody one time say, the Lord wants giants in his kingdom, not small-minded people. He wants people that with discriminating taste. You know, the Bible says that a king looks through the room and winnows the room. (laughs) <laughs> it just takes a mad king to look through the room. We watched Lord of the Rings again in that wonderful scene where the king realizes he's been deceived by Grimer Wormtongue and you see him grab his sword and he looks over at Wor- Grimer. <laughs> and Grimer like, oh no, God is winnowing the room. That means that all the chaff just got burned up and there's only heavy wheat left for the safe garner. That's where we are right now. It's exciting. And in the wake of John comes the ministry of Jesus. Oh, loved one, isn't it wonderful to belong to him? Isn't it wonderful to be his son or daughter? And that you get the privilege of being his servant, his bond servant, sworn to his purpose. Oh, it's wonderful. And all we have to do is be along for the ride. You're Forrest Gump for the kingdom. You just have to show up, be a feather in the wind, and you have to just simply be his mouthpiece. That's what I respect about John. John was willing to obey him and do all these strange things, even though no one understood. The religious leaders sent envoys to try to figure out who the heck he was. His disciples were trying to figure out who he was. The disciples of Jesus were trying to figure out what he was. It was so odd, but it was God. He's an odd God. But I want to pray for you that the Lord would let you flourish in your own uniqueness. 
So we, when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, why, why weren't you more like Jerry Falwell? Why weren't you more like Catherine Coleman? He's going to say, why weren't you more like you? Because God didn't have one of you. He wanted one of you. So he made one of you. You just have to be the best you there is. And God will be the best him through you. But we need to be free of the constriction of people's opinions and people's evaluations. And I mentioned last week, Oral Roberts once said, find out if it's the will of God. Don't confer with flesh and blood and get it done at any cost. It's so important that we be focused and circumspect right now. So let me pray for you. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are eminently holy and perfect. And yet to the eyes of fallen human flesh, you can be misjudged. You can be misunderstood. You were in your time. You taught in parables so as to isolate any whose hearts were closed, but to invite in anyone whose hearts were childlike and open. We welcome you, Lord, in all of your work in our midst right now, in our culture, in our time, in our church, in our families, in our relationships, Lord Jesus. We want to be willing to be misunderstood. Jesus, we want to have your heart. We want our heart to break over what breaks your heart. We want our hearts to rejoice over what makes your heart rejoice. We want your friends, but we also want your enemies. We want you and everything to do with you, Lord. Forgive us of our judgment and false evaluations of others, Lord. Forgive us, Lord Jesus Christ, with your holy blood of miscalling and misjudging and making ourselves uh, uh, rabbis that are sassy and, and constantly giving our opinions when no one's interested or asking for them. Lord, give us a heart to pray and intercede for everyone in our lives and not pass judgments anymore. Help us, Lord, get on our knees and pray for all of your loved ones and pray for every situation, O oh God. Give us hearts of compassion and love for one another. And we thank you, Father, for the uniqueness of every one of your daughters, Lord. Lord, I bless you for that you had not made this woman of God in any different than who she is, Lord. And she doesn't need to match up to anyone else's standard. Thank you for her uniqueness, Lord. And I pray for your sons, Lord, that they don't have to compete and be um, someone else's idea of success. Maybe their parents' idea of success or their spouse's idea of success. That they will be their John the Baptist self. They will be utterly uniquely who they are, Lord, and free and liberated in that. We ask you to bless this word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We'll pick it up next week. We love you. We're praying for you. If you have any prayer requests, you can send them in. We'd love to pray for you. If you'd love to support the work we're doing, it's very easy to do. All you have to do is go online, drcraigjohnson.org, and there's a cover page right there, and you can bless us. Because I think it's very important that we feed what feeds us. Feed what feeds you. If you value this work and this ministry, you go ahead and be a blessing to us. It's our privilege to serve you. And so we just want to bless you this week. Be encouraged this week. Be hopeful this week. Rebecca's, those of you that have been running up and down, getting strengthened, the gold's coming, the camels are coming. Be encouraged. God bless you. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.